Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us this morning for Cernova's Investors Shareholders Conference Call. My name is Dominic Gray, Head of Communications at Cernova. With me this morning is Dr. Philip Delegas, President and CEO of Cernova. We are pleased to host this conference call today, and a recording of the call will be made available later this week on Cernova's website. For convenience, all participants have been muted. Following Dr. Talikis' presentation, we will proceed to a Q&A period to answer questions submitted by email. Dr. Talikis. Okay, so I would like to, first of all, welcome all of our long-term investors and also all of our new investors that have recently joined uh, the Cernova family. Um, today, I'm really excited to be able to talk about Cernova, where we have come from, where we plan on going. Uh, and this is this investor call is really important because um, we have achieved some really significant milestones over the past little while, both in terms of our clinical operations, our clinical trials, and our technologies, as well as uh, from the perspective of our financing that we have recently done. It has really upscaled the company significantly. And Cernova is really on a growth trajectory right now, and we're going to be uh, doing this growth very, very strategically as we're going forward. So I wanted to just introduce new people to the company and talk about where we're going, as well as uh, long-term existing shareholders. So just to begin, Cernova is uh, exchange uh, trades on the Toronto Venture Exchange, on the OTCQB, and on the Frankfurt Stock Exchange. And as we're going forward. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about Cernova uh, uplisting for investment purposes, and this is something that we're looking at as we're going forward. So I'm just uh, bringing everyone up to date with respect to our forward-looking statements, so please um, have a look at those. Um, with respect to an agenda, we're going to go over a number of things today. First of all, I'm going to talk about uh, the regenerative medicine field and how we fit into it and how uh, Cernova has become a leader in this field and why. We'll talk about our self house technology program. I'm going to be moving forward with respect to our diabetes uh, phase two clinical trial and the exciting advancements that we have been making there um, with respect to that. Um, and then we'll be moving forward and talking about next steps, talk about financial outlook, and introduce you further to our uh, Cernova's development team. So as an introduction, Cernova is a clinical stage company, and we're developing products for chronic diseases. And um, this is involving our cell pouch system, which includes a, an implantable medical device that we're going to be talking about and immune protected therapeutic cells. And we are working on uh, treatments for not only insulin dependent diabetes, but also other metabolic blood and potential neurological diseases. And the idea here is that we're placing therapeutic cells into our implanted uh, scalable device that I will talk about a lot more. So in terms of investment highlights for Cernova, we have a cell therapy therapeutics platform to treat chronic diseases. And I'm gonna go into more detail around this. And we have been working on an integrated regenerative medicine therapeutics approach and the idea here is that we have a device that we place in the body and we put the therapeutic cells into that device. And these therapeutic cells are meant to replace cells that have been lost in the body that are important for producing missing proteins or hormones in the body. As I mentioned earlier, we have an active phase two clinical trial at the University of Chicago that is ongoing for which I will be providing some additional data that has been presented by our investigator recently. And we also have proof of concept preclinical studies that have been completed using human cells for hemophilia A and thyroid disease that I will explain a little bit further. So Cernova has opportunity for multiple global markets with multi-billion dollar uh, potential for revenues for the company. And also, in addition to this, I'm going to be talking a little bit more about our interest and work that we are interested in moving forward with, with respect to our pharmaceutical uh, collaborations. So to get into a little bit more of why this is so important, this is a very rapidly evolving field. 
And it's a, it's a new branch of medicine that has been developing over the past 10 years and is really coming to light in the forefront because of a number of different successes. And what's happening here is that as opposed to just giving patients drugs to mask disease symptoms, what we're really working on is figuring out how to provide a functional cure to some of these really important diseases. So if I can explain a little bit about that, if you think about patients that have type 1 diabetes, they've lost the cells in their pancreas that control blood sugar levels. So those cells are not working any longer. So in order to correct that problem, patients have had to take insulin injections multiple times a day to try to replace the insulin that has been lost in the pancreas from that production. So what Cernova has been working on is finding a way to replace those cells that have been lost in the body so that the cells in the, in the device that we have can now take over the function of uh, the production of insulin in the body. And the idea there is to eliminate the need for the patient to take insulin injections. And this is really what the focus of what Cernova has been doing over the past couple of years. And we've not only done it with type 1 diabetes, but we're also working on a number of other clinical indications moving forward that we've shown success in. So what is our platform approach and how do we work on this uh, to be able to be successful? So there are three parts of this puzzle that we put together. So first of all, the cell pouch is what we talk about quite a bit. So what is the cell pouch? So it's a small implantable device that gets implanted uh, in a rapid procedure deep under the skin. And this device is very, very unique in a sense that is highly scalable for different cell therapy applications. And when the device is implanted into the body, it's very porous and vascularized tissue rapidly grows through pores in the device around removable plugs. So after a few weeks, what happens is that we can remove these plugs and we have highly vascularized tissue chambers into which we can put therapeutic cells. So we call this an organ-like environment because the cells, when they go in, can rapidly connect to the blood supply with small vessels and also are sitting in a tissue matrix. So this is very, very unique amongst uh, other competitors. With respect to the therapeutic cells, we are working on first human donor cells. And you might ask, why are we doing that? And the reason is that, for instance, our first clinical trials are around the use of human donor islets. Well, we know that islets work in your body because that's uh, what is controlling your blood sugar levels right now. So the idea here is that if we can put these islets into the device and test them out in patients, then you're being able to see how the cell pouch is working understand a lot about the cells and how they're functioning so that as we're moving forward to unlimited supplies of cells through stem cell derived technologies, which we also own, then we can be really learning a lot about this therapeutic approach as we're bringing in stem cell derived technologies and advancing. The third part of the puzzle is immune protection. So what does that mean? So if I put my cells in your body, the first thing your body wants to do is go and try to kill those cells. So somehow we have to protect those cells that we have in the body from immune system attack. And Cernova has taken a very unique approach by bringing in technologies that are able to, what we call, protect the cells locally within the device chambers themselves. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that as we're going forward. So. Interestingly, over the years, Cernova has gone to multiple conferences with large pharma companies, and we've been interacting with large pharma companies who are currently selling insulin, but looking for a better way to treat patients for quite a number of years. And interestingly, we have met companies who are developing stem cell derived technologies, but from the pharmaceutical perspective, it was considered that a device would be a really simple thing to do, that you can take a device, just stick it in the body, and then put therapeutic cells in. But in our discussions with pharmaceutical companies, they realized that when you think about most devices that are placed in the body, they typically form a fibrotic sac around it, and the body tries to wall the device off with fibrosis. And you know, a fibrotic device is not a place where you're going to be able to put cells. So Cernova was very unique in being able to create a device that allowed tissue to grow into it and be became a part of the body. 
And so pharma companies became very, very interested in Cernova's technology because it's what we call biologically relevant. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit further. So why is a cell pouch seem to be working amongst other types of devices? First of all, we have designed it so that the device itself will become highly vascularized. So that means little blood vessels will grow into the device. And really when you're thinking about an organ-like environment, all the cells are connected up to a blood supply. So the other part of it is that we've designed our, our device to have no fibrosis occurring. So in other words, instead of the body looking at our device and saying, let's wall this off, the body is saying, this is something we wanna grow into. So we've eliminated that issue. The other thing is that the device is scalable. So what does that mean? That means we can make different sizes of the device for any kind of clinical indication that we might be working on. So we've calculated the size of the device for type one diabetes. And believe it or not, it's only a couple of tablespoons of cells that control your blood sugar levels. So the device can be actually quite small itself. So as I mentioned earlier, we produce a natural cell environment because we want our cells to be living in the device in the same way that your natural cells live in your organs. And the device itself, we've made it to be very biocompatible. What does that mean? That means when you put the device in the body, you don't get an inflammatory response that the body is very, very essentially comfortable with the polymers that we make the device out of. And our device is made of polymers that are already approved for use in long-term use in the body. The other part of this is that our cells are able to engraft within the device chamber. So what does that mean? When we put the cells in, what happens is that the tissue will grow around the cells and there's a lot of communication that goes on between the islets, for instance, and the local tissues to be able to keep those cells surviving, including the blood vessels. So that occurs. The other part of this is that our device is very versatile. We've tested it out with human tissues for our thyroid program. We've tested it out with stem cell derived technologies for diabetes, and it works beautifully there. And we've also tested it out with human donor cells. So our device is very, very versatile. With respect to manufacturing, we've gotten a lot of questions. Uh, how many of these devices can you make? How easy is it to make the device? So we've been working with a contract manufacturer in the United States. And this contract manufacturer manufactures medical products for medical device companies. So we decided that since we're looking at a commercial product, we wanted to go to this group to be able to work with us. So our product is manufactured in what we call a semi-automated process. We can make thousands of these right now, all different sizes. We've done stability testing on it. All of our product is made so that it meets regulatory requirements for the US, Canada, and Europe. And we will be able to make product that will meet regulatory requirements for other parts of the world. As we're going forward, we're looking at the potential of working with a medical device company who could potentially manufacture this and make millions of these devices and also do marketing distribution. So Sonova is not only looking at clinical trials as we're going forward, but we're also looking at our product moving forward from a commercial perspective. So let's talk a little bit more about our immune protection technologies, because this is a really important part of it. So you probably saw that this year, Cernova purchased all of the intellectual property and know-how from a company called Converge around conformal coding technology. And then we've also done a worldwide exclusive license with the University of Miami. And what is this about? So Work has been done on conformal coding technologies for over the past 10 years, optimizing it. And the coding technology is something whereby the cells themselves can be coated with a thin polymer layer that is porous. And that porous layer allows insulin and glucose to go back and forth in a normal way. And it's been shown to be able to do that. And yet it is able to protect the cells from allowing immune cells from attacking the cells. So this is a program that we're moving forward with from a polymer perspective, and we're working with it right now to be able to put this technology into our cell pouch to combine it. In addition, we're working on what we call a gene editing approach. So what does that mean? So we've entered into a collaboration with a company called Ajax with their Universite technology. And here, what we can do is take the HLA gene 
and we can insert it into our starting stem cells as we're taking those stem cells and then driving it through the process to make insulin producing cells. You know, what is this HLA gene about? So basically the idea was taken from the fetus of when a, in a pregnant mother and, so, and the fetus has to protect its cells from immune system attack from the mother. And it actually uses and uses the HLA gene to be able to do that. So Ajax has taken that approach and been able to put the HLA gene into cells. And we see this as a very natural approach to be able to uh, help protect cells from immune system attack. So the really neat thing here is that by having and being able to work with two different types of technology approaches, we can either use one, the other, or a combination of the two to be able to uh, for our different technologies going forward. So if we move on and I talk about our biologically compatible delivery process. So we do things that are a bit differently than you might expect. A number of other companies, for instance, are creating a device. They put their therapeutic cells into the device and then they place the device into the body. So when that happens, you're placing a device in the body that does not have any connection to the tissues of the, of the body itself. So then you're hoping that those cells are gonna survive long enough while you're getting uh, blood vessels and tissue coming in, an, into the device, if that's how it works. Other companies are taking cells and either pouring them into the portal vein themselves. And so we see uh, one way of doing it, but at the same time, there are issues of, as we've discussed many, many times over with putting cells into the portal vein of the liver itself. And then there are other groups that you'll see that are taking cells and pouring them into what we call the interperitoneal cavity. And those are cells that are being placed around the organs in your body. And so for that, from that perspective, it's an interesting approach. However, we see the environment around the organs as something where there is very little blood supply, very little vascularization in that area. So Cernova has focused on uh, working on subcutaneous implantation of the device and developing it from that perspective. And the reason is because just placing something under the skin is very, very safe. It can be implanted very, very rapidly. And if necessary, the device can be removed. So how do we do this? So basically, um, the way it works is that we first implant our device in a very uh, short procedure deep under the skin, and we know exactly where this needs to go. And then in a few weeks, the pores of the device fill in with this vascularized tissue so that when we then transplant the cells into the device chambers, the tissue is already ready and we have this organ-like environment. So those cells can connect up to the blood supply and then they can start functioning appropriately. And that's why we call this a biologically compatible uh, delivery device and why multiple pharmaceutical companies have become very interested in our technologies. So let's start to move forward and talk about the diabetes because this is our first clinical program that we're working on. So there are over 400 million people with diabetes, and this includes type 1 and type 2 diabetes, and about 10% of those are type 1 diabetes. So it's an enormous potential market for Cernova's technologies. And currently, these patients are taking insulin by insulin injection on a daily basis, multiple times, either with a needle or with a pump. And this is really what we're trying to work on. In order to do our clinical trials, we had to select a certain patient population of patients that have type 1 diabetes. And we decided to focus on patients that have what we call hypoglycemia unawareness. So what does this mean? These are the most severely affected patients with type 1 diabetes. And if you read in the paper about young children with diabetes dying in the middle of the night, it's because typically they have this problem called hypoglycemia unawareness. So what that means is that when they take an insulin injection, their blood sugar levels can drop and they have no awareness that their sugar levels are dropping and they can suddenly go into a coma and die. Normally, when you think about it, if you don't eat for a while, your blood sugar levels start to drop and then you get kind of that hungry and then you get shakes and tremors and this kind of thing. And then you'll eat some food to be able to correct that problem. So the patients that have hypoglycemia unawareness are not able to detect that. And we know that the only way to help these patients is not with insulin injections, but it's with a cell therapy approach. 
And so that's why we're focusing on this, this population uh, for our first clinical trials. So I'm just going to go very quickly through some of the milestones that Synovus achieved over, over a little while. We completed a proof of concept study in humans where we showed in Canada, we showed that our device is safe and that the therapeutic cells placed into the device in these patients with hypoglycemia and awareness could survive. They connect up to the blood supply. And we showed through staining that those cells are able to produce insulin. We then, after we completed that study, we started to move forward to looking at setting up a study in uh, under FDA jurisdictions. And we were able to uh, work with JDRF and work with a clinical investigator in the United States to develop a clinical protocol from everything that we learned with our first study. And we made significant advancements there. So we work with Dr. Witowski at the University of Chicago, and he's a luminary in the field of advancing islet transplantation and also other types of stem cell technologies. And he has been an incredible physician, surgeon, and scientist in terms of working with Cernova. So we received what we call institutional review board approval, FDA approval for our trial, and we've also started working with Medtronic, who are supplying continuous glucose monitoring systems for our patients. So what does that mean? That means that they're wearing monitors to be able to measure glucose levels 24 hours a day over a period of time so we can compare before they get into the study then throughout the study. So as we move forward, um, we announced our first study patient in the study, getting cell pouch and then getting uh, the islets. And then we started to announce the professor that we were working with started to announce uh, at conferences that we were getting some positive early safety results and some efficacy indicators going forward. And what is the first thing that is the most important thing that you need to see in this field? Well, if you have a device, it's really great that you have cells that are surviving and you're not getting that fibrosis and they're getting connected up to the blood supply. But the next most important thing you need to see is, are you getting insulin in the bloodstream? And insulin in this field is measured by a biomarker called C-peptide. And C-peptide is produced when cells produce insulin. So our patients in our study, and I'm gonna talk about this a little bit more, are unable to produce um, functional levels of C-peptide so that when we see C-peptide in the bloodstream, we know that that C-peptide and those, that insulin is coming from cell pouch. So it was very important for us to be able to uh, show this in our first patient. So as we're going forward, um, we have been reviewed by the Independent Data Safety Monitoring Board, and they look at our safety data, and they have, you know, put a, a proposal in to keep the study going as it, as it is on, under those conditions. So we have gotten that approved. And <clears throat> as we're going forward, we're continuing our uh, enrollment, continuing to get more positive data. And um, as we're going forward through 2021, Dr. Witowski has presented at most recently um, some significant data at another conference just in the past few weeks, showing that we now have um, patients that are advancing through the study and continuing to do really well. And in addition, our furthest along patient has had a significant reduction in the need for insulin. And we're going to talk about this uh, moving forward. So let's just back up a little bit and talk about the study design and why this is so important. So our phase two trial is what we call a company sponsored IND. And why that's important is that it puts a lot more rigor into the study and um, there are specific requirements that the physician has to go through to be able to conduct that study. So it's very, very tightly controlled. This study is an open label study. And what that means is that data is available as it comes out. And, but the phys it isn't just released all the time. The physician will, uh, when they feel comfortable about how things are going, and the data is accumulating, then they will apply to go to uh, present those data at conferences. And this is what Dr. Wachowski is doing and is continuing to do as we're moving forward. So the primary objective of the study is safety and tolerability of the cell pouch and the islets. And secondary objective are a number of efficacy measures. And these measures are things that are important for patients that have type one diabetes. So I'm just gonna briefly go over those. So the first objective here is what we call survival of the endocrine tissue in the cell pouch. 
And what does that mean? So we have our therapeutic pouches that we put in that stay in the patient, but we've also come up with the idea of having what we call small sentinel devices that also go into the patient and some cells are put in and they're taken out at the 90 day time point and evaluated by an independent pathologist who can look at the cells, see how they're doing, see if they're vascularized, see if they're producing insulin. So it gives us a good idea of what's happening in the therapeutic cell pouch. Then we're looking at the proportion of patients with a reduction in severe hypoglycemic events, right? So these are the events where their blood sugar levels drop and they can go into a coma. Um, the next one is looking at the effects of the cell pouch and eyelids on a reduction of HbA1c. So what is that? HbA1c is a, is a measure in the blood of long-term indicator of blood sugar control. So not only are we looking at short-term, but we're also now looking at long-term um, in blood sugar control and seeing how the cells are doing there. And then we have 20 addition, additional endpoint analyses that uh, we're looking at that are around uh, quality of life and other efficacy indicators. And the reason the FDA allowed us to do that is because they want us to be able to understand how cell pouch and cells are working so that as we're moving forward through additional studies, we can pick out those measures that are showing uh, the best uh, function with cell pouch. So um, one of the things about a lot of clinical studies is that you don't get to see data that's coming out. And after the clinical study is over, everyone's sort of gritting their teeth on a certain day, hoping that the data is good, or, um, and if it's great, then the share price goes up. And if it's not good, then the share price crashes down. And I think we are all uh, aware of this. This particular trial is something where we're really fortunate because data is coming out over time as Dr. Wachowski is uh, presenting it. And we're getting to see uh, some results ahead of time. So we're not having to worry about uh, these nail biting types of, um, you know, what we call binary endpoints occurring. So how are things going so far? So with respect to safety, just to provide an overview, and that's really important is safety, the self out safety of the steps. And we're finding that the device is consistently well tolerated by the patients, um, both on implantation and also at the time of transplant. We're finding no incidences of severe adverse events related to uh, the cell pouch. And um, the safety measures are showing that we're meeting the primary endpoint of the study in multiple patients. And again, as I had mentioned before, we get reviewed by an independent data safety monitoring board on a yearly basis. And this has been positive both 2020 and 2021 in terms of recommending that the study continues as designed. So a little bit more information on efficacy and Dr. Witowski uh, presented some recent data on the mo longest observed uh, patient uh, so far, as well as additional data. So. Um, if you look at the left hand side, these are some of the measures uh, that the patient had prior to the transplant of cell pouch and eyelets. And if you look at um, the center, you can see for hemoglobin A1C, the hemoglobin A1C has been reduced after the uh, second of, after the eyelet transplant in cell pouch. The uh, use of long acting insulin has been reduced approximately 50%. So that means that the islets in the cell pouch are functioning. They're taking over the, the daily insulin injections that are going on. Um, and the patient is able to use less insulin, which is one of the key uh, factors that we're trying to move forward with is trying to get to a point where we eliminate the need for insulin. So really importantly, if you remember in terms of the severe hypoglycemic events, which can actually kill patients, after cell pouch transplant and the islets, we got to zero severe hypoglycemic events. So this is very, this is a life-saving type uh, thing that is going on with cell pouch. Again, so we then added, uh, Dr. Witowski decided to add a little bit more islets to this patient. And lo and behold, as it was announced, this patient became insulin independent. So what does that mean? Their hemoglobin A1C levels became back down to normal, a normal level uh, for similar to a patient does not have diabetes. 
their daily use of short-acting insulin and long-acting insulin went to zero, so no need for insulin injections. And the number of severe hypoglycemic unaware events continued to be zero. So um, this patient has been insulin independent, as we call, that means no insulin injections whatsoever. We reported, or Dr. Witowski reported for over nine months and ongoing. So this is very, very significant. And importantly, we continue to show that levels of C-peptide are good in the blood and positive and consistent. So um, the other thing that was shown is that the islet in the Sentinel devices are again, surviving and um, looking abundant uh, from that perspective. So in the additional patient population, the study is a seven patient study. So the FDA wanted us to focus on getting it right, not just doing a whole lot of patients. And we have five or seven patients enrolled that has been announced. And we are just in the pre-screening stages of the final two uh, patients because we wanna finish enrollment. And this is gonna be happening, anticipating to be very, very soon in terms of uh, completion of enrollment of the study. So what we're seeing in these patients is that cell pouch continues to be well tolerated and safe. And we're also seeing uh, a number of efficacy measures um, in, in these patients as we're moving forward that are very similar to what we've seen in the, uh, the longest uh, standing patient. And we're continuing to follow up on patients as we're going on. And, uh, but so far things are continuing to look positive. And I can safely say that Cernova is the first regenerative medicine company to demonstrate with a subcutaneous uh, device with, with islets transplanted that we're achieving persistent islet graft function in diabetic patients. So that means we're seeing clinical benefit in the patients as we're moving forward. And the other interesting thing that I will briefly talk about is that Dr. Witowski um, and Cernova have been working on uh, the transplant approach in and how the cells are placed in the device itself. And um, a lot of learning has been going there. And the most interesting thing is that we're seeing that a small dose of islets is all that's required to make this work, which shows that we have uh, created this uh, very, very functional islet environment. So as we're going forward, uh, we're, we're working on this study um, with our human donor islets, but what are we doing as we're moving forward? So you can see that these number, there's numbers here. Uh, things are not happening sequentially at Cernova. Everything happens in parallel. So with respect to our platform technology, um, what we're really focusing on is moving this uh, local immune protecting technology for therapeutic cells uh, with our conformal coding and our HLA gene forward three, through preclinical studies in cell pouch. Um, and our goal here is to advance local immune protected islets first and then stem cells into the clinic as quickly as we can in first in human studies. And um, then as we're moving forward, of course, we're gonna be continuing the study that we're doing now with Dr. Witowski and data will be uh, coming in. He will be continuing to present data over time and um, we're looking at ongoing safety and efficacy evaluations um, moving forward. And these data that we have so far and all of our preclinical put together, as everyone knows, we have been interacting with both pharmaceutical companies and medical device companies and have uh, collaborations underway. And we'll talk about those in a little while. And these collaborations, uh, the goal here is to be able to um, find and work with strategic partners going forward for combining technologies and for marketing distribution purposes. So again, Cernova is really thinking about not just research, but actual our products and how they're gonna be released. So uh, we also are advancing our hemophilia A program, which I'm gonna talk about a little bit, and also our benign thyroid disease program. So if we talk about hemophilia A, so Cernova is already way ahead in the field. So we work with a group of academic investigators in Europe, and we received as a team five and a half a million euros to develop a product whereby we're able to take a sample of the patient's blood who has hemophilia A, which is a bleeding disorder, 
we are able to isolate a certain cell type and then we insert the gene to correct the issue with the release of this factor called factor eight. And then we have then taken these human cells, put them in cell pouch, and we've been able to correct the bleeding disorder in preclinical models of hemophilia A. So the idea of this technology is that Typically, right now, patients are taking factor eight infusions at a cost of about $200,000 a year, multiple times a week. And if you think about it, the blood levels of this factor eight will go up and then they will come back down and then they'll have to take another level, another uh, infusion of factory. So what Cernova is doing is working on a cell therapy approach to get their body to produce factor eight again that goes into the bloodstream on a constant basis so that they don't have to take these infusions. And the idea there is that will reduce joint bleeds, improve quality of life. And so this is what we call an orphan indication um, that is about a $10 billion market a year and growing. So with respect to our thyroid program, very briefly, Cernova, I believe is the first company in the world to be working on um, benign thyroid disease and correcting this problem. So right now we're looking at patients that are having their thyroid glands actually removed. So why is that important? So your thyroid gland actually is able to control what we call your metabolism in your body, how your body uses energy. And if you remove your thyroid gland, it's very similar to diabetes in the sense is that you will die if you're not taking thyroid medications on a constant basis. And these patients, even though they're taking thyroid medications, they still go into th uh, severe depression, they have a severe weight gain, and they're, they become very lethargic. So the issue here is that it's telling you that the drugs are not working very well for these people. So what we have been doing is that we've been working on a collaboration with a professor at the University of British Columbia who was a um, endocrinologist surgeon, and we've been able to take human safe human thyroid tissue from tissue that's been removed from patients and then put it into cell pouch and then in preclinical models and been able to show that uh, we're able to have that tissue survive long-term and also we get precursor hormones into the bloodstream. So this is really important because we have the ability to be able to help these patients. So what kind of a market are we looking at? Well, interestingly, there are over 150,000 patients a year having their thyroid glands removed. Um, and there is no one out there helping these patients um, without, besides just uh, medications. So Cernova is looking at advancing this program um, with our successes as quickly as possible into the clinic. So as we're moving forward, um, we always have to talk about some of the other nuts and bolts that keep the company running and make our company very, very valuable. Uh, to not only investors, but also to pharmaceutical companies interested in licensing our technologies. So we have an international patent portfolio. So why is this important? What, what's important about it is, is it gives us certain rights in countries with our technologies so that if we work with a pharmaceutical company, then we can do licensing deals so that and our technology becomes very, very valuable to them when we combine it with their technologies to be able to get rights to operate in different countries to sell our product. So we have multiple levels of patent protection and our patent protection is very strong. And we work on uh, composition of medical devices, um, the therapeutic applications, insulin secreting stem cell derived technologies and our local immune protection technologies. So this has been very, very important to Cernova for a good reason. We don't talk about it a lot but we have a very strong patent portfolio from that perspective. So where are we going forward just to reiterate this? And this is an important part of our discussion today. So I think everyone knows that we've just recently done a bought deal and we have now $32 million in the bank. So we're very well um, financed at this point in time. And this is enabling us to significantly advance our programs, uh, we feel, much more quickly and with much more depth. And the second thing about this is allows us now to be a player on the international scene with other companies in this area. And it makes it so that our pharmaceutical and medical device partners are able to take us a lot more seriously 
because we not only have cash in the bank, but our valuation is going up appropriately for our uh, technology advances. So as I mentioned before, we're gonna to continue to advance our, our current clinical trial and we continue to have data coming out with Dr. Wartowski will be presenting that over time. We're advancing our conformal coding technology and our local immune protection technologies. And the reason that's so important is that we can eliminate the need for anti-rejection medications. And then that allows us to significantly expand our patient population that we can treat. Uh, to millions of patients and also broadens the age range of patients that we can treat so that they are not having to take these anti rejection uh, type medications that a number of other companies are also uh, using right now. So, um, then, as we're moving forward, we're looking at expanding, as I mentioned earlier, with our conformal coding and our immune protection technologies into additional clinical trials and then. Um, we're moving with our, we're looking at our thyroid uh, application moving into the clinic and we're working on developing regulatory documentation to be able to uh, move that ahead now that we've gotten uh, positive results on that side of things. And also, in addition, we're advancing our gene editing uh, program. So, what's important about gene editing? We talked about this in hemophilia. By the fact that we're able to take a gene to correct a situation, uh, with a cell, that means just for hemophilia, that also allows us to be able to treat multiple rare diseases that, um, so that where patients are missing a protein or a hormone, and we can take a cell and we can insert the gene that will produce that protein or hormone. So that gives us a virtual unlimited supply of potential clinical applications going forward that we could either work with ourselves or with other pharmaceutical companies who are working on rare diseases. And that's not to say that we're just gonna expand and, and water ourselves down. We're gonna be focusing on our key programs, but it enables us um, really strong blue sky perspective, multiple uh, potential applications as we're going forward. And again, um, we've mentioned partnership activities with pharmaceutical companies, and we see this as very key to driving these programs forward uh, from a marketing and distribution perspective. And also a number of uh, these large pharma companies have really advanced stem cell derived technologies because not only is Cernova seeing the regenerative medicine field from a therapeutics perspective, but pharmaceutical companies are now getting into the realization that um, you know, drugs are, are really uh, gonna be taken over by this regenerative medicine approach. So um, interestingly, you know, Cernova has been working in this area since probably around 2006 approximately, but what's really exciting is that timing is so important here and all of the aspects of these technologies are coming together and you're seeing other new companies coming in and with Cernova's very, very deep roots, we have established uh, very, very strong efficacy and safety, and uh, our company is uh, moving ahead very, very rapidly. So uh, very briefly, again, from a share structure perspective, our market cap uh, is fluctuating around a bit, uh, but we're typically bef between $400 million to $350 million uh, market cap. Um, as I mentioned before, we have a very strong cash position of $32 million right now, and we're going to be using that uh, very efficiently in the same way that we had when we had three or $4 million in the bank. So our, um, all, all of our team is used to working uh, very, very efficiently from that side of thing, and this is going to en enable us to be able to move um, more quickly and advance our programs as the way we want. So um, the team is really extremely important. And I'm gonna talk about um, our management team, but it's not only the management team, but it's also all of the other uh, people that are in the company and around our company that make this company happen. So um, from myself, from that perspective, um, I have combination product experience um, out of Engiotech Pharmaceuticals, um, and so we, we know how medical devices and drugs work together, and that really gave us a lot of experience around how uh, medical devices and therapeutic cells. 
And um, we have a lot of business experience, patent experience in that perspective, been interacting with pharma companies and combining these technologies for a long time. Our head of research, um, Delphina Cerrone, has uh, been working for 25 years and has multiple levels of experience, not only around surgical abilities, cell, um, cell technologies and immunology, but has also been managing teams uh, for a long time and moving forward with our uh, preclinical program and has advanced our preclinical program into our into the clinic and has been uh, very, very focused on uh, working with her team in terms of not only preclinical development, clinical development, and also the um, external pharmaceutical relationships. So um, this is also very, very important from that side of thing. And David Swetlow is a more relatively more recent ad addition to the Cernova team, but he has considerable uh, biotech experience and has been working very, very closely with our team on the financial side. And, um, um, you know, we're working very closely on building and increasing uh, the size of our staff and moving things forward. So this team, as you can see, is uh, very, very efficient. Um, all of our team together, both internal staff as well as our external collaborators that we're working with, really make up uh, the Cernova team. And the critical thing here that I always talk about is the fact that um, when you're working with a pharmaceutical company, we find that the pharmaceutical groups are really focused on either drugs or the cell technologies, but they really don't have the experience of the devices. And for the, farm, for the medical device companies that we're working with, they're very focused on medical devices, but they don't have the experience with the therapeutic cells. And we have built our team so that we have, we are essentially the hub of the wheel, whereby we have expertise in cell biology, immunology, medical devices, uh, from the business perspective, and from the uh, collaboration and also licensing perspective to be able to pull all of it together, which is why we're being respected out there in the community. So we also have a solid and strong board of directors who are not only familiar with running small companies and being successful and doing major pharmaceutical deals with large companies, but also on um, the ability to be able to take a small company and work with us closely and transition it to the next level. And when I started at Cernova, for instance, the, we had a market cap of about $3 million and about $100,000 in the bank. And now we're close to 400 million market cap. And now things are, are really getting to move really quickly. As I mentioned earlier, this takes a lot of collaboration and we're working with a lot of groups. There's uh, a number of companies that uh, because of confidentiality from the pharma side and medical device side, I can't really talk about at this point in time, but this is really a big team that is collaborating to make this technology work. So for more information, um, we invite you to, to go to www.sendrover.com. We have this presentation there and we invite you to ask additional further questions. Um, but we really appreciate the fact that you have already provided a number of questions that we're gonna go over right now and, um, and bring forth um, some answers to you. So thank you very much for uh, listening to this presentation and um, we're very excited about that the future of Cernova and the present. Thank you very much, Dr. Delekis, for this update. We will now proceed with the Q&A period. We have received many questions from investors and shareholders and would like to thank you all for your time in submitting those questions. We'll try to get to as many questions as possible. So the first question comes from Robert Jones at National Bank Financial. According to the January corporate presentation, Cernova continues to be undervalued in comparison to recent peer evaluations. Could you share your views of Cernova's valuation? Right. So what I do here is um, we look at, if you look at Cernova, we're a clinical stage company. We have reduced our risk. We have clinical data for type 1 diabetes. We know that our device is working. Cells are surviving. We're getting clinical benefit in patients. And so we look at what who else is out there in this field. And there are a number of other benchmarks now that have come along. And one of these is SEMA. And SEMA is a company that has uh, developed the stem cell derived technology. 
and they were recently purchased by Vertex for $950 million, so U.S., so that gives you a bit of a benchmark. And Sigalon is another company that has recently come out to NASDAQ and currently has valuation of around $750 million U.S. They also are preclinical. They're just starting to do some work in the hemophilia area. And Cernova, in comparison, has a market cap of around $300, $330 million. And we have been validated in terms of our technologies with actual real clinical data and also preclinical data and multiple other applications using human cells. So we, we take all of that and put it together and we see that uh, the valuation of Cernova is uh, really, really positive for our investors as we're going forward. And uh, we have a long way to go to um, keep, that, keep that going. So another question from Mr. Jones, could you add some color to the strategy behind the recent bought deal financing? Yeah, so um, Cernova has been uh, invested in by retail investors and by high net worth individuals over the years. And we really, really appreciate the support that we've gotten over the years from our retail investors. But as companies grow, you want to start to get institutional investors into the company. There is a significant amount more due diligence that will be that will occur from the institutional investors before they invest. And um, it also has the potential as we're moving forward to bring uh, a lot more funds into the company from these institutional investors who become invested in our company and really allows us to secure funds to advance our programs more quickly, obviously in a very efficient manner. And it really provides us the respect that we have earned in the field when institutional groups start to come into the company. Another thing about this, we were able to raise the $23 million and there was a very, very strong interest in quite a number of groups uh, continuing to come into the company, which shows the interest that we've had. So I think this is uh, really helping us to upscale the company to the next step. And we're getting a lot of questions about uplisting to a more senior exchange. And this is the process that you would go through to get there. So the last questions from Mr. Jones. What are the next catalysts that will have the largest impact on the share price? Right. So there are going to be multiple catalysts in the short term moving down pipeline. And, and you can see that we, Cernova is determined to get lots of news out to our investors. And we are going to continue that through the year. So this is not something where you're, we're going to disappear now for a number of months. You're going to see more news out on a consistent basis. But things that we think are going to really drive uh, valuation are really additional data that's being uh, released by our physician as he presents at conferences um, and other data that's released by the company at different conferences, collaborations, agreements with pharmaceutical companies continuing on. And our goal is not just to have a collaboration, but to have licensing deals. And that will strengthen the company significantly and build valuation. And also, as we start to expand our patient populations and increase our clinical programs, not only to different indications, but also with our local immune protection technologies as they move into the clinic, I think you're going to see a very, very significant increase in valuation. Next question is from Jack Balaguyan. Could you please describe what is meant by the word collaboration with several major drug companies regarding the company's technology? Does collaboration mean separate clinical trials, or is it restricted to a review of data produced by clinical trials? Also, is there a time limit on these collaboration agreements? Right. So the purpose of a collaboration agreement typically is when a company has a certain technology. Uh, so let's say we're working with a pharmaceutical company that has a stem cell derived technology for type 1 diabetes but they don't have a device and they don't have immune protection cells. So they will hook up with a company like Cernova who has those other parts of the technologies that are critical to be able to have a full product. And what we'll first do is be able to combine our technologies in what we call a collaboration. So we'll do some preclinical work and some testing work and see how the two companies work together. And then based on that uh, work, if we get successful efficacy and this kind of thing, 
Then we look at sitting down and working on a licensing deal that would be mutually agreeable to both companies or some other business terms to be able to work together long term. So these collaborations are actually extremely important to both companies to be able to develop these multi-billion dollar products. As we're moving forward and we are getting more and more data on our clinical side and our preclinical side, then we feel that the potential for doing deals is going to happen faster and faster. And also, in addition, with the idea of doing multiple collaborations, then you can see as companies come in and want to license our technologies, there's a potential for a competition between companies to be able to do that. The next questions are from Dr. S. Taylor. How protected is the technology by patent? How easily could it be copied? So with respect to patents, we know early on that your patent protection is, is one of the key features of a company. And we hire the best patent agents and lawyers, as well as internally, we have a lot of patent development experience from our other companies that we work with. So as I mentioned earlier, we have multiple levels of patents that we filed around the world, and these are patent applications. And then what happens is that they get reviewed by each country in the world to be able to see how you, our technology fits in with what's already out there. So is our, is our technology novel? Has it been done before and this kind of thing? And based on that, you can get what we call patent claims and actual real patents. And Cernova has patents, full patents for all of its technologies around the world. And of course, we continually advance our additional patents and we have what we call divisionals. And what the divisionals do is they help to broaden out your technology. Essentially, one example of this is that when we first started to file our patent applications, we, we got claims for the specific components of the cell pouch, specific materials. But now what we have are claims that basically say that we have the rights to any kind of polymer that is used to make our cell pouch technology so that is a real significant broadening of our claims. So that just gives you a bit of an idea, but we're very, very confident about our, our patent technologies. Next question from Dr. Taylor, where are you getting the stem cells from and are they fetal? Some original companies that started out very, very early have been working with embryonic stem cell technologies, but the, as what we call the IPSC technologies have advanced, so these are, technologies whereby you can take what we call a fibroblast cell, and then we can drive that through a system to be able to make insulin producing cells. And they're considered ethically derived cells. So, you know, like a skin cell. And so these are the kind of cells that Cernova is focusing on. And we have a worldwide exclusive license to a stem cell derived technology that we brought in a few years ago, but we're also working with uh, the major pharmaceutical companies in our collaborations towards, you know, combining our technologies with these advanced stem cell technologies. Next question, could the procedure eventually be pe performed on a relatively large scale by general surgeons? Interestingly, that's exactly what's happening right now. So our patients that receive cell pouch can go in get cell pouches implanted and they typically go home that day. So it's, it's, you know, it's another positive thing about putting cells under the skin. So our approach is that we want to be able to have our cell pouches and our therapeutic cells being able to be put in millions of patients at any hospital in the world. And this is how we're developing our, our processes and our products going forward. And there is a lot of work going on in the background that will be coming out over time in terms of some of the collaborations that we're having uh, from on the medical device side that we think people will, our investors will be very, very happy with in terms of, you know, doing, getting, moving things forward from a commercialization perspective on that side. So the last question from Dr. Taylor, is there any way to up or down regulate the insulin production? Is it simply a matter of the number of cell introduced in the pouch or do the islet cell respond to normal bodily reg regulation of insulin production? So what's really beautiful about islets is that it's a feedback loop, very similar to the thermostat in your house. So fortunately, when you're at home and you're controlling your temperature, you don't have to sit there and dial the temperature up and down every few seconds to, to maintain the temperature. 
And this is how islets work. So they are able to read the blood sugar levels and they can release, they can produce and release insulin accordingly. So if we put millions of cells into the cell pouch, we don't have to worry about overdosing the patient because the cells, when the blood sugar levels have reached the appropriate level, those cells will stop producing insulin. And the same approach is being taken with our thyroid program, whereby it's a feedback system that will be releasing um, hormone as, uh, as the body needs it. So it provides for a really good safety margin. And for our uh, hemophilia program, those cells release, release factor eight on a constant basis. But the really interesting thing is that we know that if we can get between eight and 10% of the normal amount of factor eight in the body, then we can completely control that, um, the side effects of the disease. So again, we have a very, very wide safety margin, which is another reason for moving into a cell therapy type approach. Our next question comes from Brendan DeGans. With all of the milestone that Cernova has been able to reach over the past year, I assume that there has been a lot of growing interest from other large pharmaceutical companies. I was wondering if you could speak a little to that and in particular, what Cernova's goal are in regards to working with those companies. Are you looking strictly at licensing the cell pouch technology or are you also looking at potential buyout opportunities? So I think what's really important here is that um, a company like Cernova is interested in working with large pharma companies. Um, we need, it's really important to develop relationships. And Cernova has been very good at developing relationships, and that is with business development associates and also scientists in the large pharmaceutical companies. Um, so what happens there is that these companies are typically looking for new technologies to be able to combine with their technologies to move to advance. Now, the cell therapy and the regenerative medicine field is relatively new for them, so they're also understanding that their insulin business is going away because the patents are going away and people are looking for better um, applications to be able to treat these different diseases. And they can see um, some of the technologies like Cernova's technologies coming down the line as taking over the market. So um, therefore they become more and more interested in working with us. And um, what our goal is in working with them is in potential uh, you know, coming up with agreements to be able to collaborate and work together, develop a product, and then get that in, get that onto the market. As time moves forward, what you will see, if this all works, is that Cernova's valuation will start to go up very, very, very quickly and significantly, and then we'll start bringing revenues in from the product. Because when we do a licensing deal, then we will get um, upfront payment milestones for as we we're successful, and also royalties. And if you look at us treating millions of patients, the royalties will start to increase very significantly. And there'll, there'll become a point in time when the pharma company will have to decide, is it better to buy the company or is it better to keep working uh, collaboratively? And Cernova is looking at doing deals with multiple pharmaceutical companies. So that's going to give us a lot of options to make our own decisions also about what is the best uh, in terms of valuation for the company, what is going to produce the best value for our investors, and what is going to keep uh, de-risking our programs as we're moving forward. So we have lots of uh, decisions to make, and we're not going to put our um, stake in the sand and say, we're, we're doing this. We're going to look for opportunities and do the right thing going forward, keep our minds open. Our next question comes from Germany from Mike. How many patients are needed for finishing all clinical study phases to get an FDA approval in the end? In this regenerative medicine field, if you think about it, we're working with a number of diseases such as the hypoglycemia and awareness with diabetic patients. So it isn't the typical type of clinical development program where you do a phase one, phase two with about 20 or 30 patients, and then you do 500 patients for phase three. So you're seeing, you know, in the current trials that everybody is getting involved in uh, for the pandemic, you can see there's thousands and thousands and thousands of patients in these phase three trials. But what we're doing is we're going to be working closely with the FDA 
to determine what number of patients are required to be able to get approval. And this is a real close interaction between the company and the FDA and also in relationship to the data that's coming out. And that is also related to uh, the, the importance in, in terms of the unmet need in the patients and how Cernova's products are helping these patients. So if you look at what kind of data is coming out from our technology so far, I think we're looking at a very, very positive uh, direction from that perspective. And as I said before, we're really at the forefront of the field. So we will keep investors informed as to how things are going, but we're not expecting huge phase three clinical trials with our products. Next question comes from Mr. Orr. Does the company intend to upgrade its listing so institution in the US can buy the stock? So interestingly, um, we just did uh, an institutional round with our uh, bought deal. And so institutions and US investors are already able to invest in the company. However, our reasons for being interested in uplisting over time, and we're looking into the appropriate strategy to be able to make this happen in terms of time um, and valuation of company and this kind of thing. Uh, we're going to do it at the right time and in the right kind of way. Uh, but what that enables us to do um, is, is significantly increase the number of investors who can get involved in Cernovus. That might be a NASDAQ listing, it might be a TSX listing. We have a number of different opportunities and we're evaluating these um, and making plans right now. Our next question follows Mr. Orr's question. The question comes from Mr. Eastman. Cernova has talked recently about a NASDAQ listing. Cernova must meet certain threshold requirements in order to qualify. Once those requirements are met, how long could it take to be listed on NASDAQ? There are a number of different pathways to be able to get onto NASDAQ. And Cernova actually fits into one of the pathways that can enable us to, you know, have a, a, a more simple approach to be able to do that. And this is something that we're looking at. I think what's more important is not, you know, how fast you can get it onto NASDAQ because it can be done relatively quickly, but it is really important to be able to do it smart in a smart way. And that is making sure that Cernova is getting the right valuation to be able to do that. It's also ensuring that we're working with the right bankers, the right institutional groups, and to ensure that when we get on NASDAQ or whatever senior exchange we move to, that we have the appropriate support behind it. So it's really, uh, we're gonna be taking a multi-dimensional approach and making sure that we do it right and um, doing that at the right time. The next question from Mr. Michael Schiller. You work together with the University Hospital Würzburg as part of the Horizon 2020 project. Does this connection still exist and how will the cooperation with Germany look like when it comes to clinical studies and hemophilia? So really importantly, um, our team, our key team that we have in Europe is still intact. We're still interacting with uh, the key scientists there in terms of working on uh, getting publications and advancing our product and looking at additional grants and that sort of thing. And at Würzburg, we were able to work with some of the patients who have hemophilia A. And we would be very interested as we're going forward in conducting a clinical trial in Europe as, as a thank you and support for the European uh, support of our technologies from the grant perspective. So yes, that, that the relationships are intact and are, are still moving forward from that perspective. The next question comes from Dean Tickles. Based on the London Free Press article, it appears that some of the monies from the bot deal are going to be used to hire more staff in the coming year. What should shareholders anticipate will be the ratio of in-house research versus third-party research, for example, the Chicago study, over the next 12 months? So, Cernova is focused on um, moving quickly, as, as quickly as we can. And that revolves around uh, working, putting a strategy together that is building our in-house staff 
as well as uh, working with external collaborators. So, um, and also for our clinical trials. So what we're, what we're working on here is in terms of our new technologies moving forward, um, we have very uh, strong expertise in-house and we're increasing that expertise so that we could be able to move uh, faster from that perspective. But then we're also working with, um, you know, groups such as the University of Miami and uh, Dr. Wachowski's group at the University of Chicago because they bring certain expertises that we have immediately um, and also with our pharma collaborators. So I think that's a little bit of a difficult question, but the most important thing is that we're going to be spending our money in the most efficient and uh, time sensitive manner possible going forward. We've received many more questions. Um, the next one is, can you talk about the thyroid market? Is it true that the thyroid market is presently underrepresented by pharma? Yeah, so interesting thing is, um, if you have friends that have uh, thyroid disease that are taking thyroid medications, there are a population of patients that, you know, take a thyroid pill every day because their thyroid levels are a little bit low. Um, that's not the market that we're going after at this point. What we're looking at is 150,000 patients a year who are having their thyroid glands removed for thyroid uh, for benign uh, reasons. And these are the really severe patients that absolutely need a technology like Cernova's technology. And interestingly, um, Cernova is involved right from the beginning of thinking outside the box on this, on these kinds of technologies. So we have found a niche in these patients that are having their thyroid glands removed who could use our technology and need it in a desperate kind of way. So um, this is an area where pharmaceutical companies have not really looked at at all, but we see a huge market, a, a billion dollar market for Cernova to move forward on. So. Do you believe the immunotherapy technology that you acquired recently will eliminate the need for any suppression drugs? How game changing is it? So we see this as we see the, the next step for Sonova's technologies in reducing or eliminating the need for the anti rejection medications as really opening up our technologies to millions and millions of patients. So um, this is, I call, I would consider this to be game changing. Um, it's an area that we're really, really excited to move forward with, and our clinical investigators are also excited about that because it, it will just ex significantly expand the patient population because it will eliminate the need for um, any concerns around the anti rejection type uh, medications that um, patients that are having organ transplants are using at this point in time. So this will be a very, very significant advancement in the field. And the idea that Cernova is working on two different technology approaches is also, I believe, uh, a very intelligent way to be able to go from that side of things. Cernova's immediate goal is to develop a functional cure for diabetes, followed by hemophilia A and thyroid. What are other possible indications do you see moving forward? So, um, Again, uh, we, this company works on our applications in parallel. So we don't do anything sequentially. Uh, so I wanna emphasize that, but where we see things moving forward is, and I'm, we're very, very excited about the idea of um, the rare disease areas where there are smaller patient populations, but very, very significant unmet need uh, in these patient populations whereby we now know how to replace a gene that has been lost in these cells to be able to help produce these proteins that patients are having to take on a daily basis. So I see the rare disease areas um, as, as expanding um, moving forward. Next question, can the pouch be reused after explantation? Yeah, so the, the beautiful thing about the cell pouch is that um, it isn't like a container kind of thing that you can just take out and then put in. It incorporates with the body's uh, tissue and biology. So we put those therapeutic cells in there and into the device and the cells become a part of the body just as the device becomes a part of the body. Um, so if we have to remove the device, it provides a real safety kind of check for us so that if for some reason 
um, the cells in there need to be replaced or, or whatever, we have already set up the ability to be able to remove the device. So we have procedures to do that. And we've been able to do that not only in our small animal and large animal study, but also in, in humans, we have a process for being able to do that. So instead of taking the device out and, um, you know, putting new cells in, we actually will put a new device in there. We think that's the best way to go because it will develop that new vascularized tissue into which we can put the therapeutic cells. So we think that's the best approach. When do you expect full enrollment of the T1D trial? So as I mentioned earlier, um, one of the really things that um, I have to give our staff credit for is that and our clinical team, as well as Dr. Witowski's group and our collaborators, is that we have all been working through the pandemic. None of us have stopped. None of us have sat at home and watched television or something. We have been working double time to move this company forward. And I think the number of things that we have achieved this year, you can see it very, very easily that we've been very, very successful. So, um, um, <laughs> to answer the question, um, we have, we, we are continuing to move uh, forward on, on those things and um, we're, we're just driving our processes um, as we're going forward with, with that idea in mind. When do you expect to release further data on the T1D trial? So um, this is, um, in terms of the data coming out of the trial, as I mentioned earlier, it really isn't CERNOVA that, that releases data. It's really dependent on our clinical investigator. And what typically happens is the clinical investigator will apply to go and report to his colleagues at conferences additional data. And Dr. Witowski is, uh, as you know, is very, very prolific from a publication perspective and getting out there and talking about the research that he's doing. And he is very excited about uh, the technologies working on with Cernova, and we're excited about working uh, with him and his staff. Um, so we see him, um, you know, continuing to go to conferences, continuing to release more data because uh, Cernova sees our technologies as first in the world and we want uh, other, you know, we want to be participating in the field in terms of uh, the advancements of the regenerative medicine approach. And you'll see Dr. Wartowski out there doing that too. Why were you not able to obtain a fast track designation for your T1D trial, but your competitor Vertex did just recently? So that's a very interesting question. And for Cernova, it's all about strategy. So it's not that we were not able to achieve that. It's a matter of when we think it is the most appropriate time to go and work with FDA. And um, you can, you can um, kind of use that approach as a marketing approach, but we're really using it, you know, to get that clearance. And what that really is about is that you know, the company and FDA are working, you know, intimately more closely together, but it doesn't necessarily give you, you know, immediate approval or something like that. What we're doing, on the other hand, is we're collecting our data and we're interacting with the FDA, but we're going to do um, this approach when we're ready and when we think from a strategic perspective, it's the smartest to be able to do that. What aspects, advantages make the company stand out to be attractive to investors in the medium and long term? So I think uh, the key thing, it's great to be able to be a preclinical company. So your technology works in animal models with animal cells and this kind of thing. But the real proof of the pudding is how does your technology work in humans? And you can see a number of companies that I've mentioned that have billion dollar valuations, jumping onto NASDAQ and this kind of thing, preclinical, but their technology is really untested in humans. And Cernova has now tested its technology and shown uh, definitively that our uh, technologies are working, that they're showing clinical benefit in patients. And um, it's a start, but it it's, it's showing that we're in the right direction. And even for our preclinical programs, you may have missed this, but we're working with human cells. So we're even part way there by working with our human thyroid tissue 
and our hemophilia cells that are human cells, we're working with the human cells itself and we're actually getting closer to clinic. So I think it's not only having clinical data, but it's also having the right technology approach. So as you remember, we have what we call a biologically relevant approach in terms of our therapeutics. It's also having the right team. And we have built um, our internal staff and our internal management team who have not only uh, the expertise uh, to be able to do this work, we have problem solving expertise and we have forward looking appro approach expertise to be able to do this work and from the business side. So I think those those things are, are what drive the company forward. Um, and I can tell you that, uh, you know, even looking at how Cernova did through the pandemic, we didn't stop ever. We kept on going and this is how, this is what our uh, corporate approach is. And you'll see us uh, moving even faster as we're going forward. Time is running really quickly, Dr. Tadekis. We will have time for one last question. What are your biggest challenges for the next few years? So I think I, I look at our challenges more in terms of how we use our opportunities. So we, I, I consider uh, Cernova kind of like a tree that's growing. Um, when, when you have just a leaf that's growing out of the ground, it's very fragile and this kind of thing, and you don't, it could be crushed at any moment. Um, but now we have developed very, very strong roots internally, and we're now uh, really coming out onto the world uh, market because we have now clinical data. Um, that has opened up huge opportunities with other pharmaceutical companies. Uh, we have uh, potential going forward with licensing deals and this kind of thing. And I think it's really how we manage the opportunities to stay focused and make sure that we strategically make the best decisions that will build, build shareholder value as quickly as possible, and also continue to build our products for the patients who have these severe unmet needs um, in getting to, the getting to the clinic and to the market as quickly as possible. And I think that you will see um, over the next while as things continue to evolve, and uh, lay out in terms of how what what our strategies are behind the scenes that um, this is going to play out really really beautifully coming forward thank you very much dr talekis for your time today and giving us a corporate update and answering questions and we look forward to following the progress moving forward yeah i want to thank everyone uh for for coming to this conference call and we're going to be having these on a regular basis to provide updates to investors as we're going forward